I want to go back to a simpler time. God knows that we need that more than anything at the moment. I don't need to tell you about all the random things going on in the world. If it's not one thing exploding halfway across the world, it's something lurking in your own backyard. It seems like the world wants us to just be constantly angry or bitter or cynical. Because there's just always something going on. It's just constantly go, 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 go. Be angry or be concerned about this next huge event. There's always something to attack or defend, which requires so much time and effort that at some point you even forget why you're doing it. You get so caught up in the day of the week that you end up forgetting what day it is, because there simply aren't enough hours in the day to appreciate them. So for just a moment, let's appreciate something. Anything. Because it's been a hard time going, and me personally, I just need to breathe. I just need to breathe. And despite the upcoming holiday, it's funny because I've always rather been hesitant to do an Emerald animation on this particular show, and this episode in particular. And that's because I don't think history has looked too fondly on the Rugrats. Back in the 90s, this was the show that ruled the world. It was probably the most popular cartoon of the 90s at the time. Sure, shows like Ren and Stimpy and Hey Arnold were well-loved and became major cult classics, but very few other shows had the mass appeal that Rugrats did at the time. The only other one that came close was The Simpsons. Rugrats had it all, specials, video games, theatrical movies. Rugrats was inescapable in the 90s and early 2000s, at least until the torch was passed down to SpongeBob. While Rugrats does still crop up now and again, you can usually find at least one of the characters in most Nickelodeon get-togethers, and there's their new series on Paramount+, Plus which seems to be getting an okay reception. <laughs> oh god, that is the worst synth I've ever heard. Also, the parents are millennials now. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. The point being is that the Rugrats being the biggest thing on Earth is something I actually need to tell people these days. It's like needing to explain that Spongebob or Scooby-Doo was once the biggest thing on Earth. And I suppose part of that might be that it's kind of hard to explain the appeal of Rugrats. Like, a lot of the show, especially early on, relied a lot on seeing the world through a baby's eyes. The show was basically trying to be cute. They had a lot of misunderstandings about the world and tried to piece things together, usually misled by Angelica, who often told the babies lies for her own advantage. It's also got that classic Chupo art style that you'd probably have a hard time selling to people this day and age. These days, we like our characters looking roughly like people and not like potatoes. And of course, despite trying to be cute, Rugrats had a good helping of that 90s gross out. The babies keep a lot of things in their diapers. And with babies, you've got to have a lot of obligatory poop jokes. Also, 70% of Phil and Lil's personalities are that they eat bugs. And that's basically a lot of what the episode I've chosen to bring up, Mother's Day, is actually about. Like, the first chunk of the episode is the kids learning what Mother's Day is through Angelica. And so most of the kids go looking for gifts for their mother. Sometimes that means looking in their diaper for candy that became stuck, or under the couch for a week's old cookie. But the main thrust of the episode actually revolves around Chucky, and it's an episode like Mother's Day that helps remind me that Rugrats was a pretty progressive show for the time. I mean, among the adults, you do have Angelica's mother, Charlotte, who was a CEO, and you also had Howard, Phil and Lil's father, who was a homemaker. And then you have Chucky's family. Chucky has a single parent, Chaz. At least this was before Kimmy. Which, as you probably know, wasn't the most uncommon thing in the 90s. Doot 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 doot. But for the most part, it was basically background dressing. In a Disney movie like The Little Mermaid, for instance, the mother being dead has absolutely no effect on anything. Absolutely nothing would change if the movie did not make this arbitrary decision. Same thing for Beauty and the Beast. Same thing for Aladdin. Same thing in Toy Story. In most of these cases, it was more or less a lazy attempt at characterization. To basically say that a child's relationship with the living parent was stronger by doing literally nothing. Actually, doing less than nothing. Since that's a character you don't need to make concept art for, fit into the story in any way, and actually make sure that they're in the work to begin with. And while I can't say that Rugrats never fell into this, it did really depict some of the challenges of being a single parent with Chaz. And this episode here really does go into one of the hardest parts of that, and that's actually the loss of your partner. I'm going to be absolutely blunt here. At least 80% of this episode in particular is standard Rugrats fare. It's why I was always hesitant to give this episode in particular an admirable animation. It's not bad, it's just typical, you know? As in, if you like Rugrats, you'll probably like this part of the episode, and if you don't like Rugrats, you probably won't. Most of the episode is about the Rugrats trying to find a present for their mother, until Chucky comes over. Realizing that he doesn't have a mom, the Rugrats try to find him one, in a way that only a baby's misunderstanding could, by thinking everything and anything could be his mother. That is until Angelica gets wind of this, and basically agrees to be Chucky's mother to get him to finish her Mother's Day project. Earlier in the episode, Chaz brings a box of things to the Pickles residence, asking Dee Dee to hold on to it for a while. What is it? 
Oh, it's a box of stuff that belonged to Chucky's Bob. I, I don't want him to find it. I wouldn't call Rugrats writing particularly great, but it does have moments of greatness. I like the subtlety here. Chaz didn't say his wife, or even her name Melinda. He said it in a very specific way. And maybe this wasn't intentional, but you tend to find yourself referring to people you cared about who passed on in sometimes strange ways because those ways are the least painful. Granted, maybe I'm seeing something that's not here. But as we go through the episode and get to the end of it, it's clear that Melinda's death, although at least a year on, is still quite painful to Chaz. And it's like 17 and a half minutes before this episode goes from typical to something truly special. After Angelica banished the Rugrats to the closet, they find all of Chucky's mother's things. Throughout the shenanigans of the episode, Chucky realizes that the person who does all the motherly things in his life is his father, and he wants to give him a Mother's Day gift. And he stumbles across a photograph of Melinda, and when Chucky presents this photograph, we get a moment of prolonged silence in what is usually a very loud and bouncy show. Chaz wants to put the stuff away, but Dee Dee talks him into talking about Chucky's mother to Chucky. I think it's time you shared these things with Chucky. Well, I'm just afraid he'll miss her. Then you can miss her together. It's moments like this that make these characters feel so much more real, and the rest of the episode is very sweet. I'd say that even if you didn't like Rugrats typically, what we get at the end of this episode makes all of the typical Rugrats tropes worth it for these particular moments. Chaz goes on talking about Chucky's mother and what she was like. This is her diary. She started keeping it when, uh, when, she, when she was in the hospital. I don't often praise voice actors or praise them enough, but Michael Bell, the VA for Chaz here, really does bring things home. It's hard to put a lot of emotion into a soft-spoken character's speaking style like he does here, but his voice acting really makes this moment, and the ending of the episode shine especially. Speaking of which, the episode ends on a poem read out in Melinda's voice, which I'm not going to spoil for you here, but I do want to showcase everything around the poem. There's just a few details here, but it really does paint a picture. Belinda was in the hospital. They don't sugarcoat it, downplay it, or beat around it. And the poem is mentioned to be the last thing she wrote. The content of the poem definitely makes it sound like she knew it would be the last thing that she wrote. And through all of this, they paint a nice picture of who she was. Death can be cruel. Memories can be even crueler sometimes. You try to look back fondly on people or even animals that you've lost, and those fond memories just remind you that you've lost them. Among all of this, you remember being distracted with this or that when they were alive. Your life, your job, or the flavor of the moment. And it burns inside. It hurts. The temptation to distract yourself from moments like this and put those memories in a box grows, but it's not possible to hide from the memories. Not forever, at least. And through it all, it's not a good idea either. If someone is worth crying over, they are worth remembering. I spent far too much of my life worrying about things that weren't that important in the long run. I've wasted far too much of that time sad or angry or bitter. It makes it so much harder to appreciate what you do have while you have it when you're like that. Sometimes you really do need to put those feelings away and remember what and who makes life worth living. I hope you all have a happy Mother's Day this year.